Can we thank Candy and Zane and the worship team for leading us so well? So much good. Ooh, so good. I want to greet all of you guys online. We're so glad you're with us. Welcome. This is Austin Christian Fellowship. If I don't have the pleasure of knowing you, my name is Will Davis Jr. and my bride Susie is sitting back there and we're glad you're here. Welcome to the church. Welcome you guys online again. We're so glad you're part of this. If you need a Bible here in the house, we love giving them away. So we have folks coming down the aisles. There's a hand right there. Uh, take a Bible. You can keep it. You can give it away. You can just leave it in the seat when you're done, but we want you to have it. And for everybody else who has a copy, I want you to find Acts chapter 20 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Maybe 1 Corinthians, excuse me, I lied. 2 Corinthians 9. There's a big difference. I'll repeat those. Acts 20 and 2 Corinthians 9 here in just a minute. Uh, two weeks from today, we're going to baptize again. Can't wait. Baptism is so much. I love it when you cheer for baptism. It's so good. People are signing up. Um, you, not, you might need to be baptized if you've not been baptized before or you've not been baptized since you came to Christ. A lot of us had experiences where we were baptized as babies. It's a beautiful thing. Biblical baptism is a post-Jesus experience, with Jesus experience. You meet him, you get baptized. And I don't know anybody who's ever been baptized or regretted it. They're like, I should have done it sooner. So it's an act of obedience that God honors. You can sign up. There's the information on the screen, I believe. And actually, so go to our website, and there'll be a link there um, on how to sign up. And we'd love to have you be part of that. It's in two weeks, and it's going to be something special. So we are in a series called ACF 30. We're celebrating 30 years of Austin Christian Fellowship. Tuesday was our official 30th anniversary, which is crazy. Yeah, it's hard to believe. Yeah, that's cool. And um, one of the things I'm doing this month is talking about values that have kind of risen to the surface for us as Christians and as a church, lessons we've learned to take forward, and also honoring people who have made this church what it is. And the couple I get to honor today, really I could honor this week or next week because the topics really come out of them. Um, so Steve and Jalen Shaver are sitting right here, and they are ACF royalty. Okay? My dad, my dad used a phrase, high cotton. Uh, he, he may or may not have picked cotton a couple summers in East Texas. High cotton is when you have a banner year, and to be in high cotton was to be in a really good crop. We're in high cotton with Stephen Lynn. I can't overstate that. I can't tell you how many times in meetings we'll say, well, Steve taught us. So the two of the real driving factors of ACF are missions and others centeredness. Stephen Lynn came to ACF having done a camp for kids and also doing missions around the world and brought this, it's not, about us mind, it's not about us mindset to our church, which was new to me. I thought it was all about us. And uh, I got to go on my first mission trip as an adult with Steve to uh, Mexico and watch him lead and watch the Lord work in missions. And it was the best week of my summer. And he, direct, he started our student ministry here, Steve did. And he really brought life to our, he didn't start our missions ministry, but he brought powerful life to it and took us to places we wouldn't have been otherwise. Taught us to go and say, what can we do? Not go and say, here's what we want to do. He led a discipleship ministry here. His fingerprints, and we talk about you, Steve, all the time. And it's all good. They don't talk about me that way, okay? Um, Steve is the director of spiritual formations at uh, Austin Stone, the West Campus down in Lost Creek. And he's an elder there. His lovely bride, Jalen, is the better half by a long shot. And you've heard this testimony, but our missions director, Michelle Briggins, who's sitting up here, was led to Christ by Jalen. So, I mean, their fingerprints are all over this church. And I really feel, I'm so, I feel so proud to have them here today. Anyway, we love you guys. Every, so much of what is good about ACF, we owe to y'all. So can we thank them and just say way to go? And yeah. I mean that. Woo. I could go on and on. They're great people. They're just kingdom people. What's your grandparent? What's your grandpa name? Grandpa? Rev? <laughs> what's your grandma name? Libby. Libby. Rev and Libby. There you go. Even better. They're going to call you that at your funeral. You know that, right? That's why you want to pick a good grandpa name because they're going to eulogize you as that. Okay. 
Let me pray. Lord, we love you, and um, I'm so grateful for the Shavers being here. And the memories with Steve and Jalen, and uh, the first time they walked in my house over at Cat Hollow in Northwest Hills, I was like, yep, these are them. And I just pray your favor on their amazing boys and their uh, uh, in-law daughters and um, grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And his ministry, Steve's ministry over at Stone and Austin Stone as a church as a whole. But Lord, I just thank you that when we have meetings, we often can bring up Steve's name because his fingerprints are all over this place. I've been watching people come up and find him this morning and hug them. And that's just, that's just does my heart good. So thank you, and thank you for what you taught us and taught me through Steve and Jalen and their willingness to come sit with us today. Um, as I teach now, would you humble me, please, and clear my mind, and um, thank you for what we're going to get to talk about. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Acts 20. The lesson we've learned in a lot of years at ACF, 30 specifically, is the power of generosity. Now, some of your hearts just stop because you think an offering is coming. Not, you know, they, it's called take an offering for a reason, okay? Because you take it. We're not doing that today. Your money's safe. Anytime somebody says generosity, you go, oh, they can't pay the bills, or well, the ACF is not that church. Um, we've learned over the years that there's so much joy and anointing and power and provision when we decide to give more than we keep if we can, or give as much as possible. And that's true for you. And generosity isn't just money, it's time, it's words, it's whatever. But there's something so powerful about this concept that shook this church 21 years ago, probably. If you're sitting here relatively new to ACF, you need to know this, but more important today, I really want you to Op, just be open to the concept of what might happen if you, stri- if you beca- became a more generous person in whatever way God leads you. It's, such, it's so Jesus-like. So Acts chapter 20, verse 35, the Apostle Paul is saying goodbye to his friends in Ephesus. He's on a beach. He's saying goodbye. He's leading a prayer. And he says, And everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak, which Jesus talked about. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's the only statement from Jesus' life that's not recorded in the Gospels. There's a lot of stuff in Revelation that he says this later on, but this is a statement that didn't show up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but it's so Jesus. He said things like it. It's definitely Jesus But Paul here quotes a statement that was credited to the Savior that's not written down in our Gospels. And look what it says. It's more blessed to give than to receive. He actually implies it's blessed to receive. He didn't say you're blessed if you give, not if you you receive. He said you're more blessed when you're giving. It's okay to to receive. And there are times, it doesn't say when you take. But when someone wants to give to you and honor you or bless you or just help you in a season of need, you're blessed when you receive it. And some of you can testify to that. But Jesus said the better end of that equation is when you get to give, when you get to give. That's a level of blessing and favor and joy and power. Giving, I've learned, releases something. Giving transforms people. It can change an atmosphere. Generosity is, is a powerful, powerful element in the kingdom of God. So early this morning, I read two quotes. John Calvin, the wonderful reformer, said, In no way do people come closer to God than in generous giving. You, just, you find a way to get to the heart of God when you, when you give generously. One of my favorite biblical commentators, a German who lived about 150 years ago, R.C.H. Linsky, said, the glory of the whole gospel is the fact that, no, that it is nothing but giving. The gospel is just giving. So we did not start off this way. <laughs> um, our favorite ministry, our favorite mission um, at Austin Christian Fellowship, the first decade was Austin Christian Fellowship. 
If, we, if it came in, we kept it. We may have given 1% away, which is the national average these days for most churches. It's really embarrassing to talk about how, I have several regrets about ACF. One is we, hadn't, we didn't start praying hard soon enough, and one is we didn't start giving soon enough because it's transformed us. But way back in the early 2000s, when we invited, we first moved in this building, I invited a city leader who just went to heaven uh, recently. His name is Dan Davis, church leader here in the city, to come sit with our staff and talk to us about what was going on in Austin. And Dan was the founding pastor of Hope Chapel. He brought Charles Patterson, who's been on this staff, who's a mentor of mine, to Austin. He's well-known all over the world, crazy, flaming, love Jesus missionary kind of guy, but felt called to Austin. At the end of the meeting, it had been perfectly well-behaved, and nothing had happened that would have changed us, and I should have let the meeting end. And I said, Dan, give us a word. I really said, Dan, you're a charismatic, which tells you I know nothing about anything. So you're a charismatic, give us a word. I didn't even know what a word was. Well, now Dan, so the, the softball stuck over the plate and just hung there. And he hit it and he didn't hesitate. He said, be a cash, were you in this meeting when this happened? Oh. He said, be a cash cow. I'm gonna put it on the screen for you. Fund ministry. I had never heard of a church that made funding ministry its mission. I knew of churches that made funding their own ministry their mission. I'd never heard of a church that, that made their mission, let's bless other churches, let's help them succeed. And guys, it stuck. It, it was a word to us. It was, a, it was, a, it was from the, is it the heavens themselves has said it to us. If you will make this your mission, I will blow you up and, and blow you away and bless you, but you'll have more fun and you'll see more of the world and you'll get to bless so many people that if you decide to make ACF your ministry. So if you'll, if you'll fund ministry, and I don't mean yours, I'll light you up. When, that, when Dan gave us that quote, we were about four and a half million dollars in debt, which for our size church is a lot of debt. And again, this is early 2000s, a lot of money for this property and this building. Well, our elders made a, the bold decision to go from 1% giving to 10% giving, and then we made a goal to go to 50% in, I think, five or 10 years. And we've never lived at 50%. We've gotten there. We've actually gone over it for a minute or two. We hover in the 40s. We try to get to 50% giving, but it's hard. And we give a lot, but we, we really have the goal of finding ways to get to oh, more than half going out the door than what we spend. That's a goal for us. But we, we moved. We got there. And when we started giving money away, we were able to pay off our debt ahead of schedule. We were able to send out uh, four or five other church plants out of Austin Christian Fellowship that eventually went independent. They're still functioning out there. We built a youth building back there without a fundraiser and without any debt. Cost a million dollars. We built it and paid cash for it. Just, didn't even put, just put it in the budget and say, well, hey, we're going to build a building and money showed up. All that happened when we started giving. Guess what, church? Today we're debt-free. We've been debt-free ever since. You know how much intention we have of getting back in debt? We don't need to. And over the years, we've given and given and given and given and given. And it's been so much fun. It's been so transformative to see what happens when you open up your heart and your life to generosity. Um, so I, I, this one has so marked me personally because I don't have the I didn't have the spiritual gift of giving, but I kind of have grown into one. I love to give, it, and it's because I think watching here at ACF and seeing the ripple effect. But personally, I love now to give. It's so much fun just to honor somebody. So let me give you a definition of generosity. And this is I wrote this definition myself. So if you hate it, Chris Tapkin at acfellowship.org is your email. This is what I think generosity is. Generosity is the God-given desire to meet the need of another. Or even just to bring them joy by liberally sharing with them what God has given you. Sometimes generosity is about meeting a need. Sometimes generosity is about lighting somebody up and making their day or changing their life. We have a group about 
I don't know, a dozen to 15 men that once a quarter, they do the crisp Benjamin dinner. I've told you this before. They go to some restaurant and, and they each bring a brand new $100 bill, 15 of them, 12 of them. And when they get through a dinner, they leave that for the wait staff. Just to see, just because it's fun. And you see the tears and you hear the story of a mortgage can't be paid or a car payment can't be paid or child care that's not being paid for and how the kind of provision it is. And so sometimes you give because you really do know there's a need you want to meet and you want to serve somebody and, and fill a blank for them. That's a great reason to give. Sometimes you give because you just want to bring joy to somebody. You don't even need a reason. I just want to be generous to you because I want to love on you. I just want to tell you how cool you are. And God's given me means, so here's some of my means for you. Enjoy. That's what generosity is. And it's so the heart of God. For, you fill it in a blank. You know this, church. For God so loved the world, he, what did he do? He gave. Some people think for God so loved the world, he formed a committee. No. He gave. What did he give? His son. For who? People that didn't believe in him. I mean, that's pretty bold giving right there. Talk about joy meeting a need. So 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. If you want to read some great chapters on generosity, 8 and 9, really 7, 8, and 9 of 2 Corinthians are great. But verse, chapter 9, verse 10, in my Bible right here, we've got ACF written next to it. So I read this a lot and pray this a lot for our church. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Paul is writing to this people in Corinth. He's taken an offering for the saints in Jerusalem who are in a famine and they're not getting, they can't eat. They're, they're starving and Christianity was birthed in Jerusalem. And so these people are spiritual descendants of this Christians in Jerusalem and now they're in this you know, Greco-Roman culture in Corinth. And Paul's like, we need to help our spiritual ancestors. Let's take an offering and deliver it to them so they can have food. And so he's talking about that offering here. Verse 11 says, you will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. So Paul says, look, giving is doing two things here. It's meeting needs, but it's also causing people's hearts to be refreshed. Because when, when, you, when you meet a need, when they're worried about paying a bill, or uh, we do food distributions in Nicaragua, and you show up with rice and beans and, and oil and diapers or whatever, they go, you see the relief of a need met. And so it causes this thanksgiving. So generosity, three things it does. It meets needs. It fills in blanks for people. Don't discount that. It brings joy. And it honors God. I mean, what's not to love? You can write a check or you can give time. You can volunteer and in one fell swoop, meet a need, bring somebody joy and honor God. It's a pretty good day you can do that. So I cornered our missions director this week, Michelle Briggins, and said, I need, I need a story because I'm talking about how giving lights people up and it meets needs. And we, we both thought about, we've sent checks out to churches in town or nonprofits, and we'll get, we'll get a word back saying, you have no idea. We'll send a $5,000 check to a church. A different church, not AC, it was to other churches, just bless them. They don't know it's coming. Hey, here's a check. Merry Christmas. And they'll go, you had no idea the timing of this. Or, or we, really, we really needed this. We were thinking about laying off an employee and boom, here, here's a $5,000 check. How did you know? We've got stories like that f for 20 years. But the one that got Michelle, she called me in tears this week. She, you know, we're pretty close to Brooke Crowder and the folks out at the refuge in Bastrop. Refuge is a place the Brooks started for girls taken, minor, underage girls taken out of trafficking. It's a heart just to do that. It's a beautiful piece of property. They've had a brutal three years of being falsely accused, having their license taken away. Then Brooke 
basically, they got the license back and Brooke basically said, now the CPS won't send kids to us. You're slandering us again. We're going to turn in our license. The state rallied and said, you've got to stay here. And so the refuge is open. They've got some amazing girls there. We've been with them the whole time. What a, what a high and noble thing we get to do by working with a place like the refuge. So Michelle and Brooke spent a weepy time on the phone together. And Brooke believes, according to what Michelle wrote down, that the refuge would not even be open if ACF didn't, obe- I'm, writing, I'm reading what Michelle wrote, if ACF had not obediently followed God's direction in supporting and giving to them directly. That's you, by the way. What we give is what y'all give. Quote, you never wavered in walking alongside the refuge. And me personally, during the time when we lost our license, as a church, you supported me personally through prayer and counsel. When it came time to reopen, you continued supporting us through prayer and counsel. And when appropriate, you gave a significant gift so our staff could be retained until the license was restored. We basically, we didn't even know it. It was a bridge gift we gave, our missions team gave, that kept the doors open and the staff employed at the refuge until the license was restored. You encouraged us, you encouraged others to listen to our side of the story instead of listening to the only slanted coverage of the media. God wanted the refuge reopened and ACF obediently followed to that call to support us. Well, folks, when you get that kind of stuff, I'm like, where's the checkbook? Let's write some more checks. Let's send some more people out. Let's build another building for them. Let's, what, I mean, do you understand? I, I recently wrote a letter to a foundation on behalf of the refuge asking for money. And I said, it's, not, it's a pretty good day when in one fell swoop you can write a check and fight evil, save lives, rescue captives, and do good all at the same time. That's a pretty good day, you know? I said, get in this game and let's, let's, you're fighting evil when you write a check to take girls out of trafficking because it's evil. Folks, we get to do that. Can you, th- I mean, can you think of a better way to spend your time seriously? I mean, we're making, we get to, you know, we're way back in the bleachers here, but we get to make a difference through people like Brooke. And that goes back to Dan Davis saying, be a cash cow, fund ministry. Three myths about generosity, okay? Let me blow these up. Number one, it only involves money. Not true. You can be generous by listening. You can be generous with your time by serving, by being present, being fully present. You can be generous with your prayers. You can be generous with your words. Some of you are really generous with your words. So it doesn't just involve money. Secondly, it only is for the rich. No. You know, in in giving percentages, the people who give most in America make less than 50 grand a year. Isn't that sad? In percentage giving, the wealthy don't give that much. But those who, that widow's might is a real thing. Like the last thing, the, the people that are most generous in our country in Christianity are the people who make significantly less than what probably most of us do. So you can be really wealthy and not be generous, and you can be really challenged financially and be extremely generous. We see it all the time when we visit third world countries. So it's not just the rich, it's for anybody. In fact, it's usually not the rich. So anybody can be generous. It's a heart. It has nothing to do with your portfolio. Generosity has nothing to do with how much you have. It has everything to do with the condition of your heart. And generosity, myth number three, is only helping others. I've learned, boy, I get more out of it than they ever do. I, I get to watch what happens and see the tears start flowing or get the letter back and, and to think of the kingdom impact of that. Like, that's, wow, thank you that I got to do that. So a couple of things I want to put on the screen here very quickly. God's plan for your provision has never been a question for him. It shouldn't be a question for you. Like, don't not be generous because you think you can't afford to. God, God told Abraham 400 years in advance of the Exodus, when you, got, when you guys are going to be in captivity, and when they leave through Moses, you're going to plunder the Egyptians. I'm so sorry about your firstborn. Can I have that lamp? Basically is what happened. 
And they left, this slave nation left Egypt carrying all this wealth because they had to build a tabernacle. They built it with Egyptian gold. God called that 400 years early. He's not worried about how he's going to come through for you. If he can build a tabernacle with a bunch of former slaves in a desert, wealthy tabernacle. They talk about seal skins and porpoise skins and gold. And they say, where did that stuff come from? The Egyptians. Thank you. Why are you worried about God coming through for you? He who did not spare his own son, Romans 8 says, how will, how will he not with him freely give you all things? Some of you live in fear of not paying your bills tomorrow. If you're being obedient to God, he, will come, he comes through, friends. That's the story. That's the legacy of Christianity. He, i never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Why are you worried about it? Second statement is, you won't experience God's provision until you position yourself to receive it. Some of you are like, I don't want to be in that position. Too much faith involved. You'll never know what it's like to have God come through. Because God comes through better than you can, by the way. Some of you are settling for the best that you can do. When you position yourself to need to receive or to be honored by God because of your generosity, now you're in a position to receive what he does. Someone gave a gift to our church recently, and Chris told him, buckle up. You're about to get blessed. He just loves this kind of heart. Doesn't have to be a big gift or a small gift, doesn't matter. But just when you decide, I'm just going to make a statement about, a, I believe what you guys are doing. Here's what I can do. Buckle up. God honors that. Some of you are in no position to receive that because you don't ever give. Makes me sad. Sure is quiet in here. September 16th, 01. I'm almost done. September, what does this mean? The pastor says I'm almost done. I hadn't done this in a long time. Say it together. Nothing. Good. September 16th, 01 was the Sunday after 9-11. We were all just heartbroken watching those towers come down. And we had the wild idea to take an offering and, and give it to the Red Cross, which we wouldn't do now back then because the Red Cross didn't manage. They had more money they could manage and it didn't get spent well, but it was, we meant well. To help the folks in New York and the Pentagon and in Pennsylvania. And I had a little nudge, so I pulled together what was our board of directors at the time and said, let's, let's ask ACF for the biggest offering in our church's history, and then let's give it away, every penny of it. And we're not going to take a second one. So basically, it was the first Sunday after 9-11, and some people said, well, let's take two offerings, because we need, no, no, God's got us. Let's be generous and see what God will do. So I think the offering was 30 grand, which was the biggest offering in ACF's history at that moment by several thousand dollars. And we gave every penny of it away. And guess what happened? We didn't lay off employees. We didn't miss a Sunday. We didn't have to shut the doors. The money just kept coming and kept coming. And we learned a lesson. We learned a real important lesson. That if we will build out and we will bless out, Jesus said, I'll build the church. He didn't say, well, you go build the church. He said, I'll build my, it's my church, I'll build my church. You build out, you invest out, and I'll build in. That changed us. When we gave that little offering away, and God said, watch now. And so here we are, how many years later, friends? We're still here, 23 years later, we're still here. It works, it works. <laughs> Second Corinthians 8, verse 7 says, but since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in love that we've kindled in you, See also that you excel in this grace of giving. That's about the offering to the Jerusalem people. Excel in giving. We call giving here grace gifts from that verse right there. Because giving is an act of grace. Giving is something God has equipped you to do. You cannot do it without God's equipping. And it's something we get to do. And it's so much fun. So here's a word I want to say to you. Excel in giving. Excel in being generous. If it's a weakness for you, and it was for me for years... I was a tither, but I was just barely doing the minimal, and I had to learn through people like Steve Shaver and others what generosity meant. I didn't know it. So I had a, I had a weak muscle. I had to make it strong. 
right? So if you're not strong in generosity, you can be. Don't be afraid of it. You're going to love it. Once you get to generosity, you can go, oh my gosh, I wish I'd done this 20 years ago. Why do I wait so long? So don't be afraid. Here are some ways to develop your generosity. Number one, study God's character. Failure and not showing up aren't really things that God does. So if you have a faith fear that God is not going to come through for you, you don't understand God. It's his nature to come. You're his child. He's not going to turn his back on you. So if you, if you want to be a generous person, study the character of God and look at the generosity that's in God, and you'll become more generous. Secondly, pray for a generous spirit. If, you're, if your spirit's not generous, if you kind of have a, this mindset, pray for God to change your heart. It's a dangerous prayer. But pray, I used to, I, well, I'm running out of time. Pray for a generous spirit. Third, really important, slow down. The author of um, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry says, hurry is the opposite of love. You can't love well if you're in a hurry. So if you don't have time for just a three minute conversation with that waiter or waitress at your restaurant, then you're gonna miss maybe the chance to really love on them or the person that you're picking up your dry cleaning from or your neighbor across the street who has very, is very generous with his or her words. And you're just like, I don't have time for this. Generosity doesn't come with hurry. I think greed, and it's all about me, comes with hurry. But if you're, if you're willing to pull your pace down a little bit and look around, then you're going to have all kinds of opportunities to be generous. And you'll want to. Next, tithe. Get in the habit of giving 10% to your church. It's where you start. Write that first check, write it to your church. You guys online, whatever church you go to. Give that first 10% and get, get in the habit. And you can, you can really do that. You can do 10%. You'd be amazed how God will bless that. Some of you think that's like graduate school. That's entry level. Start with 10% and just, you know, 80, 10, 10, 80. Type 10, save 10, live on 80 if you can. But the tithing will teach you that you can really do this. It's like a financial law. It actually works. Give and you will receive. So start tithing. John the Baptist said this next, if you have two of something, give one away. So don't, why are you keeping stuff in that closet you never go into or that garage or that attic or that whatever? If it sits in your closet for a year and you don't wear it or eat it or sleep on it or ride it, you probably need to give it away. If you have multiples, you probably need to give some away. Except Bibles and tents. And knives. You can only, yeah, you can only, you can only use them one at a time, but you can't have too many of them. So don't give those away. <laughs> Practice on weight staff. This is so much fun. If you're going to eat out, just plan to tip big. It's just, it changes, it changes lives. You never know what a $20 tip on a $5 meal might do for somebody. It's, it's not the 20 bucks. It's what it says about them. You matter. Go, go out today after, after church and try it. Just light somebody up and see what happens. It'll make you so happy. Last, lead with yes. You may have to work to a no, but start with yes. Why shouldn't I do this? Why wouldn't I want to give here? Why wouldn't I want to take part in the refuge or give to my church or volunteer at a nonprofit? Why wouldn't I? Maybe there's a no back there, but let's start with yes. At ACF, we try to start with yes. It's served us well. We get to no's sometimes, but usually we try to say, let's imagine we're going to go with this. What could go wrong? Why would we end up doing this? King Solomon said in Proverbs, one person gives freely and gains even more, yet another withholds unduly and comes to poverty. It's oxymoronic, but if you give, you gain more. If you hold, you come to poverty. It didn't work like it should. A generous man will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. That's a theme verse for our church. Friends, I'm so emotional about this today because it's been so good to us. 
And I really long for some of you that are in financial bondage or have this cap on your faith because you don't trust God to come through for you. And if you'll just, if you'll just open your hand a little, a little bit of obedience goes a long way with God. So if you'll just give it a shot, start with a tip at a restaurant or start with a check at, at your church or just go, give some, go walk across the street and sit with a shut-in. Take your kids and go mow somebody's yard that can't get it mown. Or just, just do something that's out of your realm of comfort and watch what happens. Think about how you feel. And you'll find generosity to be one of the greatest. It, it's just, John Calvin said it, you get pretty close to Jesus when you're being generous because he's generous. Now we're going to take the offering. I'm kidding. Prayer leaders, you want to come forward? You guys online, we love you. Thanks for coming and be back. So there's no action today, friends. I'm not asking you to do anything today. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. Next week, we talk about the power of honoring others. It'll be a great moment. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for this time. Um, thank you for Stephen Jalen again. Thank you for this great story of ACF and what you've done. Lord, we pray you help us get beyond 50%. I'm so tired of hanging around in the 40s, Lord. Would you help us to get to where we can give 60% away or more because of the impact that it has? Just equip us to do that. Show us what we're missing, God. But I pray for the people in this room who don't currently release what they have, that they'll learn never is a blessing given they're supposed to keep. Blessings are meant to be shared. Make us those people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.